Thank you very much. Oh, super loud. Um, so <clears throat> I, I maybe before I start the presentation, um, um, two things. So one is that I've been here before uh, chairing the two sessions, but this is only because I was chairing the sessions, right? Because this is all Zünke organizing this. But importantly, uh, tomorrow and the day after we have this workshop, um, steps that Zünke asked me to co-organize with him and um, uh, you can check it out on this website, and uh, if you're still interested in joining, we are um, at Code University, and um, yeah, you can. You are happy to come to us and or send me a message, and join either one day or two days, and just talk to me about this. Um, then uh, the the idea of this talk was uh, to talk about um, decentralized autonomous organizations. What I I thought is to take a step back, and we had already very nice presentations today about. Um, uh, how um, such a DAO could work on the legal side and how it can help to finance research. I try to go and, and give you kind of a, a journey through the history of, of science and, 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 and the theor theoretical background there and how this could inform us how we can actually build blockchain applications and systems in, uh, for science. Um, uh, word to the uh, Akasha project. So, so I've just recently started to, to work with this uh, Akasha, the Akasha Foundation was founded by Mihai Alizi, who is a co-founder of Ethereum. And uh, the, the project that's currently um, well known is a, a crypto economic experiment, if you want to say. Uh, that's this uh, Akasha DEP, Decentralized Application, and you can go to the website uh, akasha.world and uh, look at it, download it. There's also a web version, a browser version available now. But this is, um, this is one aspect of it. What, what we are now currently working on is um, uh, growing a team um, <clears throat> that is exploring uh, how we can use basically blockchain applications um, uh, to build um, um, a collective, uh, collective intelligence. And so it's, we are kind of describing this at the border of blockchain and collective intelligence, which is a, a new term maybe for some of you, and, uh, but just fundamentally to, to have a paradigm shift in how organizations are working. And that's a, that definitely has also an application in research and science. And this is how I came to the whole field, because uh, I had an idea that I thought there is something about this whole way how it's self-organizing that could be very well applied to research. And then I read Zünke's uh, paper, and that's how for one year now I'm in this rabbit hole. So. Actually, so to start with, I, I want to, to make a claim, and that is that the research discovery process actually already is decentralized. And the problem that we are facing is that our organizations are currently not, or not yet. Um, um, so that's uh, the way that we are, as human beings, currently organized. We have very hierarchical structures. Um, the scientific laboratory uh, resembles very much the organization structure of uh, the German military in the First World War and of companies and the universities are structured in the same way. And there's um, social biologists um, uh, that, that have studied this and compared it to other systems of organization in biology and they describe the human system basically as um, we are uh, creating partitioned hierarchies um, because we believe this is how we have to control people and organize them and the instructions flow down in parallel streams and actually creating a lot of bottlenecks. We have multiple levels of command and a lot of information is lost in the centralized system also, also, also bears the risk of information loss or you have a single node of failure. So decentralization now is actually the process to move back from a centralized entity through a decentralized network of hubs and nodes and uh, spokes to a distributed mesh basically. So the, the, the word decentralization, ac at least according to the interpretation of my colleague Philip Sheldrake also, is actually describing the process of moving through these three phases here. And um, the internet in itself, it initially was uh, planned as a distributed mesh network where you have no single point of failure. It's a military research project or, or in initiative ultimately. So if one node is destroyed, you will still find ways to wire around and uh, find information and uh, flow happening. So in this system, uh, we, we basically uh, try to eliminate single nodes of failure. In another way, speaking scientifically, the, the PI, <laughs> in a way, is a single uh, node of failure in that sense that 
that, that he has a lot of burden to carry. You have to write the grants, you have to uh, uh, review papers, you have to write papers, you have to take care of all the students, and things are at least getting stuck there, and much worse things can happen uh, in terms of also abuse of power and these kind of things that we have seen recently some in institutions in Europe. Um, so now science actually is a decentralized self-organizing system and here I refer to Michael Polanyi who um, uh, wrote this article The Republic of Science and actually I'm grateful to Stefan uh, Kraus who is a professor in Oslo and he was at the last meeting and he introduced that uh, this essay to us and and so I, um, it's an analysis of how um, scientific structure actually is organized. And he did it because he was concerned about the policy changes in the UK and how they are changing to a more uh, quantified research policy system uh, that tried to d d direct the, the choice of the researchers what to do and to evaluate them, which in the 60s wasn't really uh, implemented yet, which is implemented today. And uh, so he describes that uh, sci activities of scientists are coordinated and rely on constant communication. And the adjustment of independent initiatives occurs in response of the results obtained by others. It is kind of obvious, we're building on the shoulder of giants, or, and we heard this in the previous talk as well. Then he goes on that he warns that if we are changing this, we may basically uh, bring science and the scientific progress to a virtual standstill. And this is just the second part. And I'm not uh, complaining about it, I'm just trying to analyze what we are seeing. And now when you think about the decentralized autonomous organizations and the, um, and the concepts behind it, there is, a, there is an important term that, that we hear many times, and that is stigmary, okay? And this is a social biological term that was introduced uh, um, by a biologist, I, I guess he was, in the, in the 60s or so. And that suggests that uh, if you can define it as Im important determinants of an individual's behavior, are stimuli from work previously accomplished. So I found it really cool because it really mirrors the analysis that we had from Poliani on how, how he thinks research is working. And um, actually, stigma was used to describe how termites are building their, their complex structures without an apparent building plan. And there's another um, uh, uh, study, and there's a book called The Ants by, by Höldobler in the 80s. Um, and he says individuals in a dense heterarchy respond not only to the stigma stimuli from work in progress, but also to stimuli received from their neighbors. Okay? And, 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 and this process is um, actually something we, we can illustrate. And funny enough, it was illustrated not in the 80s, but again in the 60s in the essay by Polanyi. And that is, um, he gives the example of um, a group of people that have uh, the task to build a puzzle on the floor, and this is this long text, it's better to put text, but you can read it later, that's why I put it here. I'll just tell you. So, so you're building a puzzle, and you have one, you have one organizing center like the boss, and, and he, you're blindfolded, and now you're presenting the pieces of puzzle to, to this guy, and he's the one that tells you where to put the puzzle. So that's a very laggy process, it's not working well. But what, what works very well is if, instead of doing this, you have all the people, um, maybe some have specialized tasks, like uh, looking a bit, cleaning up and doing other things, but in, in, in all, they're, they're, they are looking at what my neighbors are doing, where I am at, and, and maybe that helps me to instruct to find a slot for my own piece, because I see the progress of the others as well. And again, this is actually um, how we could describe a scientific process, and, and uh, we are looking into scientific literature, we know what others have discovered, we are building up on these hypotheses, we are not going to reinvent the wheel. So. Um, from this, uh, basically, how do we now um, approach uh, an appro uh, decentralized science? Um, what we need, uh, according to my understanding, is uh, three boundary conditions. So we, we require a free flow of information. And apparently, if we are restricting the access to information, we are locking out not people in very elite institutions, uh, but potentially those that are not able to, for instance, access the scientific literature as, uh, uh, equally as, as, uh, as we can do here then um, we need to establish some rules for governance. So I guess what is very important is to, to be open and inclusive and to, to, to somehow have a, a system of reputation established as well that allows us to, to filter the good and the bad things, um, the crazy things. Although there are examples that this works actually quite well um, in, in open projects. And um, we need to remove obsolete intermediaries because they are currently not uh, doing us a good deal. So first one, um, 
free flow of information is actually established as of today because, as some of you have probably also installed on their Google Chrome browser, um, Sci-Hub uh, plugin allows us to, in real time, when we read a paper in Science or Nature that's behind a paywall, you download a PDF, it goes directly to Sci-Hub. I just did it with my last paper in blood. Like the preprint that was behind a paywall is already there. You can read it. Uh, and I asked the journal, is it okay to have a preprint? And they told me, no, you cannot have a preprint. This, we are not doing this. And we are not going to accept it. So 2018 for a biologist, that's the reality. And the, the, the theoretical concept behind this is that data and knowledge are actually something that's defined by an economist in Berkeley called so-called anti-rival goods. There's also work um, by Primavera di Filippi on this uh, approach, and that is that actually the value uh, that we can gain as a society from freely disseminating knowledge is larger and is exceeding the value that the profit that a single entity can gain by putting the information and knowledge behind a paywall. And this is, I think, important to inform us of how we should design, um, design decentralized systems that are there to, to create value for us. Unfortunately, we cannot necessarily measure all the externalities that, that occur. But in principle, that would be the case. And a good example for this is the distribution of language. So imagine um, you, you, de you define you, you are going to speak your own language now, uh, and you try to buy a bread. It's impossible. It will not work, right? But the more people speak your language, the, the, the higher the value would be for this new language that you have developed. And an example for this would be um, not only net knowledge like medical information or publications, but also computer code would also fall into this category of an anti-rival good. The more people are using a software, the more valuable it becomes. And Linux is a prominent example of that. Um, then openness and inclusion. There is a nice example, and Laurie was speaking yesterday, and so there's a very famous mathematician. Uh, he was basically autodidactically training himself in India uh, to, to work. He, he lived uh, most of his life in uh, severe poverty. And uh, he tried several times to, to send his documents to, 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 to Britain, to, to mathematicians, I guess, in Oxford. And their comment was, well, he has a taste for mathematics and some ability, but he lacks the educational background and foundation needed to be accepted by mathematicians. Uh, so that's a very sad thing because we have a .org email address or an affiliation with an institution. We are somehow thinking that we are chosen to be the smart guys and uh, the voices of others are just not heard or you cannot actually even make the, uh, the, the way to be heard. And that's a really silly thing. Now, there are already ways of uh, successful collaboration. And this is a super long text, uh, but I find it cool because I'm from the biomedical field, so just want to give you one extra, uh, excerpt out of this, and that is, so uh, Vannevar Bush was running the um, war department of research in the US. They built an, at MIT the radar lab to try to shoot down the German planes even at night. It's really awesome stuff. And uh, to, to get there, they had to put the people in a, in a team together and, 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 and uh, physicists uh, to work on this. But there also was uh, interest in medical research. And then he said after the war, for biologists, in particular for medical scientists, which my field is biomedical, so I enjoy it a lot, there can be little indecision for their war work hardly, has hardly required them to leave the old path. They will basically carry on war research, and they did carry this on in their familiar peacetime laboratories, and their objectives are remaining much the same. So they are fighting like this, yeah, we have no uh, systematic uh, approaches of uh, curing cancer. But the physicists, uh, they have left the epidemic, epidemic pursuits. They were kind of uh, put in these uh, camps where now they had to uh, work um, in a combined effort. Of course, they were now triggered uh, to determine you have to build this. But at the same time, they had quite a lot of resources and the freedom of choice. And um, in a combined effort, they felt the, the steer of achievement of doing something as a team. They have been part of a great team. Now as peace approaches, one asks where they will find objectives worthy their best. And actually we see um, physicists or fi physical funding has remained relatively flat over history. And uh, interestingly, we see quite cool projects coming out of it. It's also that physics to defend of the biologies and other fields is a more mature field. So we are like 200 years behind uh, physics in, in biology and medicine, I'd say. But nevertheless, so the CERN would be an example for a large, massive, and actually quite hierarchically structured collaborative experiments put, uh, put together by humans. There are other examples. 
and like Linux, the internet, Wikipedia, the Polymath Project, and even the Ethereum Foundation, they, they all start with something that Peter Glor from MIT at the Center for Collective Intelligence describes as a collaborative innovation network, which usually starts in a small group of people that have a crazy idea. They are intrinsically motivated, and that's actually, actually a nucleus initially. And surprisingly, by the way, because we always think this field, the scientific field, and this is so big, and all these thousands of scientists, and no, actually, there's really very few that are really super experts in one field, and, and the rest are just running after them like the lemmings. I mean, if you think about uh, CRISPR and Cas9, this is or microRNAs, if you're familiar with that, it's like one, like two, three amazing papers, and then everyone else is just doing it. You have like a peak thousand papers the next year, and honestly, most of it you can just burn. Right? Uh, so, it's this nuclear group that started field, and, and that actually can then have a very big impact on society and create something radically new. So, we, we don't have to close our eyes and say it's impossible to start as 10 or 15 people or four at Ethereum, something that's going to be very big. Um, so, how to scale this? Uh, the, the importance is that uh, in order to remove the single point of failures, um, nothing works. If you imagine you would now entrust Facebook or any other company that currently exists to manage globally such innovation networks, this is not likely to happen, right? So, and this is where I think the, the, the idea of a decentralized autonomous organization and the decentralized infrastructure that we are currently building fits very nicely in. And to just paraphrase it, it would require um, or enable us to have transparent stakeholder controls and controlled and decentralized the organized um, entities. And we have heard a lot of uh, struggle here already these days, um, actually struggle of understanding how this can be implemented. And we are not sure really what is going to work from that. So at, at Akasha, we have now started to, to think about something that we call the conversational DAO. And I'm not going to even show these diagrams now, but I just want to say this is informed by work uh, from Paul Pangaro, who he, he, he phrased this, uh, he put this term out, that wealth creation has shifted from prior knowledge to the ability to gain new knowledge and action. And it's a bit complicated, can sink it in, but what it actually means is if we have free access to all the information, we have to wonder how do we create now uh, some value to, to, to at least feed the people that are working on doing this, right, and, 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 and creating the, the new information. And, and I think that's where the key struggle and the problem right now is, how can we find new mechanisms that enable us to, yeah, to get paid for the, for the conversation that we are doing? Because this is the time that we spend talking with other people or thinking by ourselves, so having an internal conversation. And, and this is a resource that is limited. This is our attention. Yeah? And someone that got it very wrong is actually all these social media of today that are just uh, sucking our attention for stupid uh, stuff. Uh, but the networks are there in these platforms, but, but the paradigm that they have used, and this is what Paul Pangaro also says, they have been wrong. And there was a discussion in Berlin in 2011, um, if you look at this, his talk, where people in the audience were exactly debating the same and said, well, you know, we can tweet, we can co-work on the internet with all these things, but do I trust Twitter with all the data that I would put in them? And, and so this was before Ethereum, before the blockchain uh, movement, basically. And I think with this new technology, there's a new way to open this discussion. And that's what we are currently doing. And now in the end, I give you a uh, crazy idea. So the end of institution, some, some radical thoughts of how could we change a research institute or build a research institute in the future. So basically, I would say there would be no publications. Uh, results, uh, results are annotated by librarians that are experts in data annotation. They are publishing the results and very clear description, basically instantaneously on the institute server. So the institute maintaining the database and the integrity for the for the uh, for the academic workers. And maybe you have a librarian in every lab. That could be actually cool. And then scientists work within this uh, system at a heterarchic network level. And in order to create this hierarchy and you get rid of the hierarchies, you would have a pool of definitely qualified people and usually there are always more than there would be fitting in the institution. So instead of having impact factors and p-values, uh, uh, sorry, or fighting about, about this kind of stuff, we would basically run a lottery. Okay, so we had a pool of, of uh, people that could be included in the next round of, uh, of research in the institute. And we give them five-year appointments, like a universal basic income for five years to do research. That's kind of a fellowship. You have to be qualified for this. And definitely, you will earn less than you would earn in the industry. 
So it's something that, that you have to really wonder whether you want to do it, but what we want are people that are intrinsically motivated, yeah, and not people that, that are kind of uh, doing it necessarily just for the fame and uh, not uh, contributing much to, to our advancement. And uh, basically anyone could be contributing. We could even say that those that are not going in the, f the, the pr first tier track of like going through a good university and getting the education qualifications to enter the lottery could still enter the lottery by uh, proposing good ideas and maybe helping from the outside on the, on the platform to work on the kind of crowdsource projects. And that could earn you something, not much reputation, but just uh, the token to take part in the next lottery. And maybe you make it in. Uh, and actually, this is something quite funny. I told Sönke, so I, I thought uh, when you read this book, uh, The Glass Bleed, Bleed Game from Hermann Hesse, he describes this world of the scientists and the world of the numer normal mor mortal people. And, and he describes uh, science as a game uh, or basically any, any kind of intellectual thing. And this is so important. And like the, they, don't, they don't even want to think about real world problems. They're just getting an expert in, in one field. And that's the scientific world. And, and they take also some normal people in and, uh, and, um, and, and, and educate them. But then normally they go back and do companies and stuff. But those that are really intrinsically motivated sacrifice their life and live kind of like monks in the scientific field. And I thought, okay, this is cool. Actually, this is actually how uh, maybe scientific uh, work uh, used to be as well. And uh, anyways, I just recommend to read this if you are with the background of academia. And uh, so I want to thank you. This is the end of my talk. Um, currently, I'm working with, with Mihai, Philip Sheldrake, um, and Andre Samba, uh, who are forming our nuclear research team at Akasha. And um, we are doing other things. Um, this was now really on my reflections on research and blockchain. But uh, yeah, I just want to thank them too, because there's a lot of influence I get from them right now. Cool. Thanks. <laughs>